sat next to someone on a plane once who was reading a series of Bertrand Russell essays titled, Why I Am Not a Christian. I leaned over and asked, is he convincing? Yeah, good stuff, he said. I said, is one of the reasons he's not a Christian because of all the messed up people in the church? Oh yeah, he says, this is a big part of his logic was the failures of the church. I said, yeah, Jesus loves messed up people. That's why the church has so many of them. I don't know if he knew quite what to do with my statement. Um, I don't know if I know exactly what to do with my statement. I'm not so bothered by the fact that the church is full of broken, messed up, fallible people because I'm one of them. I think what bothers me more is that we so seldom tell the truth about ourselves. We like to pretend that we have it all together, like it's only those other Christians. It was the bad Christians who participated in apartheid or sex scandals or lynchings or greed. So we distance ourselves from the bad Christians and we miss the subtly different shades of those very same sins that are resident in us. Revelation 18 is telling the truth about first century Christians. Come out of her, my people, the author says, so that you don't take part in her sins. And John's readers would have easily associated the empire that they were to come out of with the Roman Empire, empire that boasted the Pax Romana, the, the peace of Rome. The Pax Romana was a euphemism. It was propaganda. The term is used by a military state who maintains order and produces wealth through brutal repression. The empire celebrated violence in her grand Colosseum, and vassal states were given a modicum of self-rule in exchange for pledging allegiance to empire and providing the raw materials and slave labor for her exploitative economy. And verse 24 says that the blood of prophets, those who spoke up against empire, were found within her along with all who were slaughtered to keep the so-called peace of Rome. Babylon is the archetypal empire of this world. And the truth is that any of us who identify as Christians today have been lured into supporting and promoting empire. We're all mired in Babylon. The Babylon of today, just like the Babylon of the Roman Empire, has an economy that is so lucrative, so compelling, that the kings and the merchants or the presidents and the multinational CEOs get into bed with her. Nations commit terrific injustices to participate in her markets. And Babylon's economic system has produced enormous wealth for a few who live in luxury at the expense of many on whose backs that wealth is built. I peeked behind the curtain of my retirement account recently, and I found several of the funds in my portfolio had hundreds of millions of dollars invested in certain energy companies. And these energy companies were paying the governments of Syria and Sudan for drilling rights. And the governments of Syria and Sudan were using these funds to commit genocide in order to secure those oil fields. My retirement was funding genocide. I was invested in Babylon. In Revelation 18, the time had come for someone to tell the truth. Someone had to spell out the danger of God's people investing in Babylon's political and economic machinery so that they did not take part in her sins or share in her plagues. Interestingly, the presidents and multinational CEOs and the sea captains or the middlemen Look upon Babylon's destruction from far off, while the people of God are found within her. And the chief problem wasn't so much that the people of God resided in Babylon, it was that Babylon resided in the people of God. Jesus sent us to be salt and light and leaven inside Babylon. Don't take my disciples out of the world, he prays in John 17. They're not of this world any more than I'm of it. The truth being called out was that instead of living as prophets within empire, the followers of Jesus were living off of the prophets of empire. 
they had become of this world, a world in which Jesus had sent them, sends us as ambassadors, as prophetic heralds of a new kind of government, with a new kind of king and a, a new kind of economy. The call to come out was both an invitation to divest from empire and to expel the empire that had invested itself inside them. Isaiah says that the plunder of the poor is in your houses. And brothers and sisters, he could well have been talking about us today. We live in a global economic system whose gravitational energy, if left unchecked, depresses some wages to the lowest livable levels. The energy of our economy rewards the maintenance of a slave labor force of people willing to do just about anything for just about nothing. And I am the beneficiary of that slave labor. I reward it with my purchases. I have the plunder of the poor in my home, in my pocket, on my back. My consumption fuels Babylon, and Babylon thrives on cheap labor. And a cheap labor force is created through the marginalization and exclusion of specific groups of people. So racism and patriarchy allow us to identify and target whose wages we suppress. And if enough of us agree together about which people to lock out of our opportunities, out of our countries, out of our living wage jobs, Babylon remains safe. And a Babylonian economy not only needs a slave labor force to survive, it needs unfettered access to the Earth's resources. It needs to be allowed to loot the raw materials which our planet took millennia to produce with impunity. At least it needs to be able to do that for our lifetime. And isn't that what's important? Economic gain in the short term over care for God's creation in the long term. Economy over ecology, that's what fuels Babylon. Now obviously not all wealth creation in this world is exploitative. Some have even managed to pull themselves out of poverty from that very bottom rung. And there are many businesses working to be a blessing to their workforce and care for the marginalized. They seek to benefit their customers and the environment and their employees and their investors. Where's our business track? Thank you for working to place the dignity of people and the beauty of our planet over lucrative profit. But the hard truth is that a great deal of today's energy industry, international trade policies, global banking practices are built upon the Babylonian pillars of conspicuous consumption exploitation, environmental plundering, and I participate in Babylon, in my actions, in my thoughts, in my quiet acquiescence to her ways, in my grateful acceptance of her privileges. The call in this passage is not only for the church to come out of Babylon, but to exorcise Babylon out of the church, come out, exorchomai, it's the Greek word used by Jesus to cast out demons. That's what I need. I need both to withdraw my allegiance from Babylon and for Babylon to be exorcised out of me. And part of this exorcism requires that I learn the grace of contentment with a simple lifestyle. The writer of Proverbs says, give me neither poverty nor riches, but only my daily bread. And missiologist Jonathan Bonk writes that nothing could be more economically destructive than an outbreak of widespread contentment. The Babylonian economic system, fueled by our desire for more stuff, grants those who already have wealth the power and access to multiply that wealth. Wealth becomes a magnet, and it draws together into fewer and fewer hands. But kingdom economics is a centrifuge. It moves wealth out toward the margins. What if the church animated a centrifugal economy, one that pushed wealth out to the margins? What if we, 
I'm looking at you business track and justice track. What if we helped reverse the polarity of the great Babylonian wealth magnet? What if the church joined our voices with those who have been excluded, used our influence to champion the marginalized, the incarcerated, the ex-offenders, the asylum seekers, desperately poor, who are simply looking for a living wage, like the opportunities that drew my great-grandparents to North America, without documentation, I might add. What if the church told the truth about our domestic abuse, about our patriarchy problem, about our sexual exploitation? Here's an idea. What if all the men's groups in our churches sat and listened humbly to the women's groups in our churches telling the truth about their experience with men in the church and believed them? What if the church felt a holy boldness to confront those profiting from the plunder of the planet, like maybe it was something God had charged us with, as in the original Great Commission of Genesis 1? Let me rephrase that. What if I did that? What if you did that? Not just the bad Christians, you and me. What if we are the bad Christians? We're at a missions conference. We're learning what it takes to follow Jesus as we carry the good news about this new government and this new king and this new economy to others. Should we not first divest ourselves of Babylon? Otherwise, we end up bringing a Babylon-tainted gospel to the world, like blankets with smallpox given to our indigenous neighbors. We're offering an infected gospel laced with racism, hyper-individualism, patriarchy, environmental abuse, greed, consumerism. Our gospel blanket might warm the outside, but it ends up spreading a deadly Babylonian plague. You and I need to be exercised of the Babylonian worldview occupying our witness before we witness to others. Go and sell what you own. Give the money to the poor, Jesus tells the rich young ruler. Then come follow me. Before he could be a disciple, before he could be a missionary, the rich young ruler had to divest of Babylon. I travel a great deal, and I have reached the highest level medallion status that Delta Airlines allows mortals to possess. And just when I was enjoying the privileges of diamond membership, I caught a whiff of Babylon coming off of my soul. I'd been studying Revelation in preparation for Urbana, and I was identifying with the Laodicean church who had gained their wealth off of Babylon. And this was during a time that I was saving up Delta miles to bring my wife and kids to a family reunion in California. And I heard God ask, who do you trust, Delta or Alpha and Omega? I know, dad joke. Exorcism, divestment for me involve painfully choosing a budget airline for my next international trip. I had to prove to myself I was free of Babylon's grip. When I don't exchange my perfectly good but not so cool phone for the latest version, I'm exercising Babylon, the demon of consumption. When I double my commute time to work every day by choosing public transportation, I'm coming out of the Babylonian insistence on private transportation. When I divest from funds connected to unscrupulous companies, when I put others forward for opportunities offered to me, people who don't get asked because they don't fit the Babylonian gender or race mold, when I uninstall games from my phone that are occupying way too much of my time and attention, I'm performing exorcisms. I'm coming out of Babylon. It's time for us to come out of the kingdom of Babylon, Urbana. Only then will we be effective in bringing the kingdom of God and its righteousness and justice to others.